Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the garden question and answer video that I do most Sundays. You can ask gardening questions down in the comment section below this video, and that is where you're, uh, that's where I pick the questions from each week. I think there's 23, 24 from this past week. There's always way more than that, and I appreciate all of your um, asking so many great questions uh, on a weekly basis. I uh, am, again, I have a desert, uh, desert background. Uh, this is uh, Tucson. This is right outside of uh, uh, Seguero National Park. Uh, it's maybe a few more miles up the road, but they're everywhere here. This one is one that doesn't have its arms, you know, on it, on it quite yet. And the beautiful mountain uh, in the background. I had a few comments about how, how desolate the last place was I shot last week, and that was on the Salton Sea in there. There's just very little that grows around there. It's such an environmental, it's a man-made environmental disaster. That area was actually flooded with the intent of making a recreational space and the salt ended up um, causing a problem. And anyway, it, it was, it's a very desolate space. So this is a much, a little more lush. I mean, it's still the desert, right? But um, a little more interesting. Uh, uh, one thing there, uh, as we come up here um, on the holiday season and every YouTuber starts to try to sell you stuff in some way or another, I'll, I'll jump in here and say that I have gift certificates uh, for um, consultations. I've been doing a lot of consultations while I've been on the road, and there is a gift certificate option. If you know somebody who would be interested in a 50-minute uh, a gardening consultation with me, um, gift certificates are available for that. Uh, this past week, you've seen a video on Japanese maples at Isley. That was the last video that I shot over there. Um, that was, I think, ended up being four or five pieces of content out of that trip over there. And then a video from the Sunset Plant Collection that I actually shot at Mance last January. It's almost a year ago I shot that video, and I don't know why I hadn't posted it, but um, I, I looked at it the other day. I was like, oh, it's you know, pretty good. And uh, Nicholas Stadden, who I start the video with, he's been in a lot of YouTube stuff over the years uh, with Mon when he used to work at Monrovia. So some of you may have known him uh, already. Uh, and perhaps a before and after video. I still have tons of photos you guys have sent me over the last few months for before and after photos from your gardens. And I will continue to make videos out of that. There may be one of those before you see this. I don't know. Or, or will be soon if you haven't seen it already. Has been a little... Uh, little, probably a little less content uh, as this trip winds down as we're heading back toward Raleigh at this point, but uh, a lot of content coming in uh, the month of December for sure. And I got plants arriving, bulbs going in the ground, all kinds of things actually happening uh, during the month of December. Okay, so let's um, jump into some questions. One of, one of the questions was about the trip um, out here and you know what surprised you and what has been, you know, kind of confirmed in my gardening beliefs uh, over the course of this trip. And I think one of those things is something we talked about in the video with Janie uh, up in uh, Davis, uh, uh, California, is that um, that really, you know, I know people watch YouTube videos and they want the, the latest and the greatest and the most interesting thing that they can put into their gardens, but we don't necessarily live in places where those things are useful you know, for us, or they were going to require way too much maintenance or way too much water or way too much, you know, they're just going to be problematic. So you don't, we can enjoy these plants from a distance, right? Um, and that's basically what I've done on this trip. And so, you know, where some of these interesting uh, desert plants, you know, might be interesting in my garden back at home, they're here on the West Coast where they belong or in the desert where they belong or in desert horticulture invite you know used used appropriately out here in the west and i don't need to take them home they're here i can come visit them uh, and so i think that really folks concentrating on how to be the best steward you know for me it's just confirmed that being that being a steward of the environment that you live in and getting things that are appropriate to the spaces and they can be beautiful no matter where you live uh, in, in the country. So just again, just kind of confirming that as a belief uh, that I've always had, that we live in different areas of the country and that's okay. And we can have different types of gardens. Uh, and that sunset plant collection video that I did two days ago is part of that. You know, there's a sunset plant collection that's specifically for plants for, you know, out here in the desert Southwest. Okay, somebody asked about using um, anti-wilt spray on some skip laurels uh, for winter desiccation. So there are different sprays, anti-desiccation sprays, that we can spray on plants 
to prevent basically water, water loss in the leaves. So you basically spray the plant down and then when the winter wind blows across them, it prevents moisture from leaving those leaves, which could cause desiccation, which would cause, um, uh, you know, basically a burning, what would look like a burning of the leaf uh, as the water leaves it, uh, as the water leaves the leaves. Yes, you can definitely use um, anti-wilt spray, anti-desiccation spray on your skip laurels if you've planted them on a line when you think the winter wind's going to potentially damage them. Maybe for me, uh, I do a wait and see and see if it actually causes a problem before I start down that road of spraying it. So maybe I go, you know, part of this winter uh, before I just jump right in and assume that I'm going to have some sort of winter damage um, before it actually happens. But yes, those sprays are quite effective uh, at limiting the amount of moisture that can leave the leaves and help, um, you know, help wind burn, uh, prevent wind burn or help help lessen wind burn. Uh, so somebody asked about planting boxwoods in zone 7A in North Carolina. Now, definitely, boxwoods are, most, most of them are hardy up into zone five. So if you're in zone seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, you're planting something that's hardy in zone five or six, you're definitely, you know, we can plant all winter long, and especially those things that are that cold hardy. Uh, I, would, I would definitely get those in the ground. So somebody has a red bud and a crab apple tree and they're growing together. I guess they just came up in the same spot or the crab apple came up from seed uh, next to this red bud. You know, how to get, they want to know how to get rid of the crab apple. I think you've just got to saw it off at the base so you can just break it down slowly, you know, so that you don't get hurt and then cut it off flush at the base. I would not attempt to dig it out because you would probably end up damaging the red bud. And then I would assume that you're going to get some sort of root suckering or some sort of regrowth from the stump that you're leaving behind and you're just going to have to cut those off with a shovel uh, over some period of time. But that's, you know, when you get two trees growing together, uh, you know, if you tried to dig one out, in all likelihood you'd harm the one you were trying to save. So cut it down and then deal with the suckers as you, as you get them. So somebody has a big giant water oak. Um, they don't have a mower or a shredder to break down the leaves and they were wondering, you know, how deep those leaves can be, you know, before they become a problem. So we're going back home to this exact same thing. We have a white oak that's on the back property line and it drops a ton, and I mean an absolute ton of leaves uh, down into this, uh, um, into just one corner of the back garden and they'll be way too thick. I mean, it'll be 10 inches of leaves. And what I'll do is just go and rake a good portion of those out down to about three, three inches or so, and then spread them out around the rest of the garden. Um, I can take them out to the driveway and cut them up, but if you don't have that ability, the main thing is you just need to thin them out and disperse them over a wider area. And I say, I don't like to let leaves leave the property uh, because it's free mulch, but there probably is someone, lots of, there's probably several people watching where you have five giant, uh, trees like this and it's so much across your entire property that it's silly not to you know let you, know, you probably do let some go <laughs> and let the city come and pick up some of them uh, but for us we just have this one giant tree and I'm able to spread those leaves out and you know then that the nutrients that that tree used during the year just get returned to everything uh, in the garden somebody wants to plant camellias in seven zone 7a in Long Island um, and wanted to know about cold tolerant uh, ones. Well, number one, you, even, even if you do get the zone six camellias, you definitely want to plant camellias up near your foundation uh, up in Long Island. So some sort of protected space outside of the wind. We were talking about that desiccation spray for the laurels. Uh, you don't want to, uh, uh, there's a hummingbird right, literally just right next to me. It's right behind the camera now. Um, but the, the, the camellias that are, are the hardy ones, there are some zone six, six camellias. The, for the fall blooming, or there's the winter series of camellias, and then for the spring blooming ones, there's the April series. So April tryst and several April, um, several April. And if they have April or winter in the name, they're probably the ones you should be using. And again, though, I'm probably not going to put them out in open space where the wind can do some damage to them. Somebody's got a queen mum agapanthus. They bought because of sale prices. A lot of folks are out shopping now because you know the prices are you know 50% off or whatever as everybody's putting up Christmas trees. They bought a queen mum agapanthus. They want to know if they um, should plant it now or overwinter it. 
If I was like in zone nine or 10, I'd probably put it in the ground, probably in zone seven or eight where it could be marginal. I'd probably keep it uh, in the container. And can they divide it? Yes, you could just wait till the toward the end of winter as it's breaking dormancy again and, and divide it. But I would probably keep the contain, like a unheated garage is probably the best place for that plant for the winter, uh, you know, and, and so it still goes dormant, but it uh, doesn't try to put on any growth during the winter time. Uh, so somebody asked about an amelanchia or service berry for zones, you know, they want, they want to grow one in Chicago that is a narrow habit. I'm not aware of one actually, a uh, service berry that has a narrow habit. If somebody knows of a variety, don't, you know, that you can name it down below there. With amelanchia or service berries, there's a lot of different species. And Autumn Brilliance, which is the one we have in the front garden, is actually an interspecies hybrid. So you'll see it amelanchia X. Um, Net, that little X next to amelanchier means it's an interspecies hybrid. So there's a ton of hybrid amelanchiers, tons of different species, and then tons of named named cultivars, named varieties of them, tons of them. Uh, and, you know, they have been named over the years, but I'm not aware of one that just grows really fastidious, you know, upright um, uh, and narrow, but I, but I may be wrong about that. Uh, so somebody asked about planting panicum uh, on a slope in zone eight. Should they wait until the spring? I frequently talk about planting, waiting till spring to plant ornamental grasses. So, um, you know, that, those grasses are gone dormant at this point or they're in the process of going dormant at this point and you could have an issue with, um, you know, them rotting. But if you're planting them on a slope, Maybe, I mean, so, so, you know, there's an exception to anything, I guess. And so if you're planting them on a slope and you don't think they're gonna stay uh, particularly wet during the winter time, cause it's well drained, you could go ahead and plant them now if you, if you wanted to. Um, so the, again, there's an exception to everything, right? Uh, but t more, more often than not, I plant grasses that go dormant only in the spring up until about midsummer. And then I just kind of back off of it. Just, and it's just because I had to replace plants. I had one year guarantees on plants. Uh, in the nursery and I had to replace them. Uh, and gra those grasses were one of the things that more often than not were the replacement thing, fall planted grasses. Let's see, um, so somebody asked about growing plants and seeds uh, of plants that develop tap roots. Uh, can, they, uh, can they go in trays and pots with no issues? Well, it depends on the plant really. Some, it, some plants will not grow very vigorously that, have tap roots like pecan trees have tap roots and if the tap roots get damaged it can actually be a less vigorous overall tree uh, going forward uh, but tomato is actually a plant that done from seed actually has a tap root if you do cuttings on tomatoes they don't develop tap roots but from seed they actually develop tap roots but it has basically no negative consequence having damaged the tap root in the tiny little containers uh, and then and then them going in the ground so it's going to be a plant to plant kind of a thing, but most plants that develop tap roots, if they end up damaged because they were in too small of a container are probably, probably not going to have issues, but some will. And what that issue is that they will be stunted and they will grow differently uh, in the future. But it's weird that tomatoes actually by their nature grow tap roots from seed, but we grow them in little containers and then that, you know, it doesn't end up happening. Uh, let's see, somebody has an Emily Bruner holly in zone 8A in two years in a row. It's dropped lots and lots of leaves in the fall. And is there any way to prevent it? So something's going on with that plant that is stressful. Uh, and I don't know if it's planted too deep or if it's not getting adequate water. Fall tends to be drier. And I talked a lot about evergreen plants lose leaves in the fall, uh, typically. Some actually will molt toward the end of winter some going into winter. So you'll see conifers thinning from the inside out this time of year. You'll see, um, you'll see, you'll see, you know, azaleas will lose some portion of the interior of the leaves. But if it's something like this holly and it's losing so many that it's, it's really, really noticeable, then something is stressful for that plant. They had said they had moved it around several times over the years and that kind of thing and had done it from cuttings or something originally. But, uh, so I, I'm guessing it's not, happy it's too much shade it's too much reflective light off of something it's too dry in that space it's it's too something i don't know what it is um but that's what's going on when 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 the leaf drop is excessive it's stress um somebody has a patio peach in a container in zone 6b they want to know how to overwinter it 
Um, you know, that thing's already in the zone five and you're in zone six B. So the main thing is, is to not let the pot freeze solid for a long time, but still keep the plant cold. So an unheated garage is probably the best idea. That's kind of the best space to put it. You could put it on a, uh, uh, put it up against a wall foundation somewhere. It, days that it's warm and it's not, the pot's gonna thaw out during the day, that thing can absolutely be outside. So it doesn't necessarily need to be in there all winter. But the times of, it's really about it staying, the pot staying frozen solid for some extended period of time. It's okay that the pot freezes. I mean, I was in a nursery business for 25 years, even things that are, not as cold tolerant as you would think. The pot can freeze, it just gotta thaw that next day because the water's locked up in that container uh, and the plant has no available water when it's frozen solid. So keep, the, keep it from staying frozen for multiple days in a row. That's true with most things you're overwintering outside. Uh, and then it, you'll really get that desiccation issue with that wind blowing across the, imagine the wind's blowing across the leaves or the sticks or limbs or even, even deciduous plants blowing across the top but there's no available water because it's locked up uh, down below. That's where your d damage comes from. Okay, so this is an interesting question. Uh, somebody, um, they, so th they're, rooting, th they're rooting basil uh, in soil and they ended up getting root rot and the, and the basil dying, but then they rooted in water and it has all these crazy amounts of roots on it. So why is it a plant that doesn't typically like water uh, <laughs> you know that you, you, you say you can't grow plants in a lot of water but you can root them in water somehow uh, and then but then you put them in the soil and because you, you say that plant needs to be on the dry side and all of a sudden it gets root rot and dies or what, whatever so it's an interesting question uh, and, I, and I think that we have to understand one thing that one thing that's interesting is roots that root into water are different roots than roots that root into soil. They're, believe it or not, there's two different, they're two different types of roots. When you root something in water, the roots that form on that plant are actually capable of taking oxygen and minerals from that water. They are not the same as the roots that that plant would have made uh, in soil. In soil life, the plant takes its oxygen from pockets of space in the soil and it's minerals from the soil and from microbial activity breaking things down and making them available for, the, for those roots to take up. They're two completely different kinds of roots. Some plants are incapable of making water roots, okay? So you can't root them in water at all. They just don't have that ability. But a lot of plants are capable of making two types of roots. There's not a tremendous amount of understanding how this is possible, but that's the difference. In, some plants are, you know, where, where, but when you, so when you root that basil in water, when you move it to the soil, it has to re-root. Those roots are not the roots that that basil is going to have. So it's really super interesting. Uh, and again, it's um, uh, one of those fascinating things that plants are able to do. A lot of times plants are not able to root in the water and then have enough energy to root a second time. So you'll root it in water and then move it over to the soil and it dies and you go, what did I do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong. The plant only had enough energy on that cutting to root into the water first. Uh, it's a very interesting, um, very interesting thing, but I'm glad somebody asked it because it is, uh, it is interesting that plants are cap some plants, not all, but some plants are capable of making two distinctly different types of roots based on the conditions that they're growing in. Okay. Um, so somebody talking about an amaryllis uh, in the ground in zone 7A, Tennessee, how to get it to survive. I would spring plant uh, your amaryllis. So you, you, you enjoy the flowers indoors. You're getting amaryllis bulbs now. You're forcing them inside, growing them, enjoying the flowers, and then plant them in the ground in the spring. That's what I would advise in zone 7 for amaryllis. And I think uh, uh, White Flower Farm, they do some specific cold hardy amaryllis and I think they only sell them coming out of winter uh, so look on their site um, if you're interested in growing some that are specifically specific varieties for colder for colder spaces uh, so thought my thoughts on limb spreaders so that this person's got a fruit tree or some sort of tree and all the limbs are just kind of growing right into one another and they want to use uh, a limb spreader or something to tie it apart and, t and to separate them and train the limbs to go in different directions I 
I absolutely would. I think I've said before on some of my tree farming videos that you're 100% control uh, and I would absolutely go for it. Um, if you want to bend a limb in a different direction, just be gentle with it. You know, over time you can bend them exactly where you want them uh, uh, to go. So uh, that's, that's a funny, um, you've probably seen a tour video from the neighborhood of uh, the weeping Katsura at friend's house in the neighborhood. And most weeping Katsuras are giant wide, 15, 20 foot wide weeping trees. The one in that in my neighborhood is only three feet wide because he's been pinning the limbs to the ground forever so that they go, they weep straight down to the ground. And that's how it's able to be kept so narrow. So you can really, you know, get in on some of these plants and, and do whatever you want to do to them and, and, and manipulate them, um, how you want to manipulate them uh, just a little bit at the time. Uh, so somebody asked about what is the best compost to use because they used a bunch of chicken manure and they just got a lot of green growth on their perennials, not many flowers. That can happen with high nitrogen fertilizers. So, you know, yes, this is compost, but when you smell that smell of a chicken manure compost or cottonseed compost is another one that has just a lot of nitrogen in it, you're gonna force tons of green growth on things. Uh, maybe sacrificing some flowers, not always, but sometimes sacrificing some flowers. Plus, I just don't like to push things with that much nitrogen, because the more you, I've, I've talked about this, the more you're pushing these plants, the more susceptible they can be to disease, insect problems, those kinds of things. And so that doesn't mean that chicken manure compost isn't okay though. I just would probably use less of it, um, you know, and then use mushroom compost or um, typically cow manure compost doesn't have as much nitrogen, and although it does have some, and then of course leaf compost and wood chip compost and all of those things. Any of those things are fine, but chicken manure and uh, I used to use uh, cottonseed compost on some landscape jobs and it was fantastic. One thing it is good at is like bringing soil to life really quick. Like that nitrogen, that, that shot of nitrogen on a really, if I had a very poor soil space, maybe like this desert right here behind me, you know, that chicken manure compost or that um, cottonseed compost can really be a jarring thing to get things moving just like I've talked about using 12 inches of wood chips or something like that it's like this jarring thing that happens that gets everything moving but then after that I back off you know on, on the nitrogen uh, let's see uh, somebody has a, a kuba they think is in a little too much shade it's just got one little single piece coming up on it um, should they prune it or move it well you can always prune it in half and then see what happens, right? Uh, but if it is getting like really super, super limited light, even shade plants like some direct sun. So if it's in too dark a space and it's stretching like that, it is probably letting you know it would prefer to be somewhere else. But that doesn't mean that you can't, you know, cut it in half and wait and see if it responds a little more positively uh, before you move it. Uh, so somebody asked if I'm happy with the LED light panels on my growing rack. So years ago, I did a video on the growing rack that I use for uh, starting seeds. Uh, and two of the panels are LEDs and two of the panels are fluorescent lights. And I said I was going to do a follow-up video on how <laughs> I like them. I have not. And so here's somebody asking the question. I don't like the LED panels as much. There are better LED panels than I had in that video, for sure. But the fluorescence, even though they use a little more power, man, that little bit of heat that that fluorescent light produces also seems to be helpful in germinating and, uh, and getting the seed started. So uh, I prefer the fluorescent tubes overall. If I was running a constant, thing, grow, a constant growing operation where I was constantly germinating seeds, I was making a business out of, you know, of this in some way or another. I'd probably use LEDs just to keep my power bill down. But since I'm only like two or three times a year starting seeds for just a few weeks and it's just two fluorescent panels, uh, they don't make a noticeable difference in my electric bill in any way, shape or form. I prefer the fluorescents. Uh, but you know, the LEDs are more efficient. Um, but, and there probably are better LED panels than I have in that video. Let's see. Um, so somebody has a Camellia sasanqua, 
uh, they want to cut it in half or cut it by two thirds. And when would they do that? So it's going to be blooming now. Camellia sasanqua is blooming this time of year, November. Typically, it's the peak kind of blooming uh, period for Camellia sasanquas. You can cut it coming out of winter, and you can cut it super hard. I will tell you that it'll take a couple years for that thing to look normal again. Camellias just don't recover as fast. I've mentioned mentioned that a few times over the years, uh, but they will recover. Uh, so. Um, so, okay, so this is a big topic that's coming, is this the new 2023 USDA hardiness zone map. So the hardiness zone map's been updated, and it slid some people into slightly warmer spaces. Maybe you were in 7B, and now you're in 8A on the map. And, you know, um, so there's a lot of talk around the USDA hardiness zone map update. One of the things that was updated, I think, in 2012, back in, nine, I think it was updated in nine, 1990, and then it wasn't until 2012, and now 2023. Some of the changes we've actually seen on it is, number one, we have a longer data set, right? And you know we've trended warmer in most places over the last 10 years or so, so obviously having that 10 years of data on the old data has probably pushed people slightly into you know, half a zone, more hardy, you know, more hardy. I've got, and in fact, I've got a, uh, had a, qu oh, one of the next questions is about distinguishing between the zones. Um, so let me throw that right here in the middle of it. The difference between zone 7A and 7B, uh, this was the question, is about the A and B part, is just five degree increments. The zone map used to be zone 6, zone 7, zone 8, zone 9, and that was 10 degree increments of average nightly temperature. And boy, that's a big difference. I mean, that is a huge difference where some of these plants literally, the roots die at 15 degrees, but they don't die at 17 degrees. When you're talking about 10 degree differences, you know, it was just too much of a span. So it was just divided into A and B for five degree increments of average low temperature. So that's what the A and the B is. So again, people are, have moved maybe slightly one of the actual the main things with this new zone map is we're in a digital in a digital world we're able to really compile more data and so this map more than anything has allowed us to get in closer into the spaces we live and so this, you know this person was asking from Boise uh, Idaho and Boise is a great example and I'm in another great example right here I'm in Tucson Arizona which is probably zone 10, uh, I would think. But if I climb up to that mountain that you're looking at behind me, I'm probably going to lose a zone or more. Uh, you know, in fact, I did some hiking yesterday and went behind one of these mountains and, you know, on the shady side of it. And, you know, there's some moisture in the ground and it's quite cool. Uh, so, you know, in a place like Boise, Idaho, we're in a mountainous area, the zone, you know, you can drive just a few miles and the zones change radically. You know, just a minor elevation change. I've seen that up in North Carolina mountains. In Boone, I play a softball tournament in Valley Crucis, which is down below Boone, North Carolina, and it'll be 95 degrees in the field playing softball, and then drive up to Boone and it'd be 75, just in a very short drive. And so that's the main thing we're getting out of this new USDA zone map is a more of a fine-tuned thing where we can blow up the map and really look into some more detail in a more localized way. It just had these lines going right through, you know, like Boise's only this, uh, when we know Salt Lake City and places like Boise and Colorado Springs and Denver and these other places where part of the city's in the valley and part of the city's in the foothills of the mountains, they're very different spaces. And so I think that's the main thing we're going to get out of the new map is you can look and see kind of where you pinpoint where you are on the map your neighbors may be in a different a different zone. So uh, kind of excited about that. Just more detail in it and more ability to just kind of get closer in on the map to where we actually live. Um, and then a longer, a bigger data set. Somebody was asking about hydrangea paniculatas that will get the coloration change uh, in the south. And I had talked about one uh, that's coming up called Sweet Starlight. I'll talk about more, talk about it a little more in the spring. It's one one thing about hydrangea paniculatas and hydrangea paniculata breeding that we've seen, uh, and they've become more and more and more popular, of course, limelight, you know, even before limelight, there were great hydrangea paniculatas, but then limelight just kind of kicked the door in, and now there's so many 
uh, including White Wedding, which I've shown off many times, and Moon Dance. And I mean, it's just, it seems like every year there's 10 new ones. But one of the big things has been that we've seen coloration where they, the, the blooms start kind of green and then they go to bright white and then they can go to pinks and reds and that kind of thing before they turn into that papery color. But in the south, we just don't get that because our nighttime temperatures are so warm that they just go from white to that papery thing. They skip that change of color into pinks or reds. But that sweet starlight was picked specifically for getting that coloration in southern areas. And so I'm excited to show that off uh, next year and it'll be part of the Southern Living Plant Collection. All right, uh, so, so, okay, a couple more questions, um, or one more question, actually, but before we're done here. Uh, somebody asked, how is Holly? Holly has not been in my question and answer videos the last three or four weeks because uh, it's kind of prickly <laughs> out here in some of the spaces I've been shooting the uh, videos, but she's absolutely doing fantastic. She's had an amazing trip. She loves... Um, she she's still walking three times a day and i you know took her for a long walk uh this morning some of these desert places aren't the best uh but any place we can come across some grass she loves and then uh, she you know loved the beach on the her first time over in the pacific and she's been in like 30 states now that dog that dog has been well traveled uh, in 15 years and she'll definitely be back in the videos uh in december uh knock on wood her you know her the tumors she has under her throat seem to Whatever's going on, I'm just hoping that you know we get we get we get more time with her because she is a uh, very sweet a very sweet dog as you guys have seen in the videos for the last six years. So thank you for asking about her and uh, um, so far you know knock on wood um, she's doing pretty well right now for an old old 74 pound husky mix. Um, so thank you guys for. So thanks for watching. Thanks for following along. Again, there's going to be a lot of content coming on the Learn to Garden video series uh, that's over on my website uh, during the uh, month of December. And uh, you can also think about giving that as a gift as well. If you've got a uh, somebody who's bought a new house or something like that, it may be a gift um, that will help them get started in their gardens. Thank you guys for watching.